All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Discovering Multifamily podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And today we have a special guest here with us, Grant Bledsoe. And Grant is the president of Three Oaks Capital Management based out of Sacramento, California, which is a fee-only financial planning and wealth management firm. And is also a RII, RIA, excuse me, um, which basically is a registered investment advisory firm. So he's got a lot of different perspectives from the planning perspective, uh, wealth management perspective, and how it all ties back to uh, your general wealth. And, you know, particularly in our instance, we talk about real estate on the show. So happy to have him here. And, and thanks for coming on, Grant. Thanks for having me, Anthony. It's a ple- pleasure to be here. Sure, Grant. So uh, now we're at the end of the first quarter of 2021. A lot of crazy changes happening in in 20, uh, 20, in 2020, and now even more changes are, are coming our way. Um, so how are you best advising your clients to adapt to the quick changes? Uh, we're recording this pretty much as soon as the new stimulus package was just signed, um, I think last week. So I guess, how are you preparing your, your clients uh, for the quick changes that, that are inevitably coming? Well, I mean, <laughs> The easy answer and the kind of the cop out answer there is is it just it just depends with everybody. You know, if everybody's got a unique perspective, they've got a unique family life, they've got a unique career, and um, what we do at the firm is help people do the best they can with what they have and really squeeze the most um, juice out of the fruit, so to say, with with their assets and income and so forth. And we have a, a process that really governs how that's done, but really for everybody, what it comes down to is having some kind of long-term plan in place that that really establishes who you are, what's important to you, what you really want out of your resources and, and family life long-term, and then moving the pieces of the puzzle around in a way that's most aligned with those longer-term objectives. So last year, we had a bunch of uh, legislation that, that came out. We had stimulus checks, we had the Paycheck Protection Program, all sorts of interim um, uh, short-term tax changes due to the pandemic, of course. And as we're recording this, we've got a, a brand new batch of legislation. The American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 was just passed last week. So there are all sorts of these different oppor- opportunities from a planning perspective and uh, tax nuances. And I, I don't know anybody to which all those nuances are going to apply. But the whole idea is, is when you have a financial plan in place and some idea of what your long term direction is, it becomes pretty clear what those opportunities are when we have these short term um, pieces of le- legislation that come up because there are always planning opportunities, we just don't know exactly what they are. Um, and same goes, goes for real, real estate investing. You know, real estate investing might not be for everybody, but uh, it, once you know what you're trying to do long term with uh, your assets and with your life and what's important to you and what your values are and all those kind of, you know, hippy dippy qualitative um, uh, points, it, it, it becomes pretty clear what, what a good real estate opportunity might be for you and what a not so good opportunity might be for you. Excellent. That's great. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about some of the vehicles uh, you provide? I think we were talking about medical professionals before and um, a little bit about them and how they cater to real estate, how you advise your medical clients. Yeah, you know, our, our focus at the firm, we're, we're not exclusive to one type of client, but most of our clients tend to be business owners and or medical professionals. And I would say probably 50% of our, our, of our clients check both of those boxes. So they're your uh, local dentists, orthodontists, uh, we have cardiologists, we have ER physicians who work on a 1099 basis and are technically self-employed. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of planning things that you can do around that when, when you're uh, the owner of the business. You can set up your own 401k plan. Uh, you can set up other types of tax beneficial retirement plans on top of that, like a cash balance plan or uh, a personal defined benefit plan works really good if you don't have any employees and you're in your uh, late late 40s to, to early 50s and trying to save aggressively on a tax deferred basis. 
And so <clears throat> when, when you're someone who has maybe like a smaller staff, like a local, um, we, we have uh, a veterinarian who we work with or used to be a veterinarian before she sold her business, um, had a really good experience with this. Oftentimes, it's really beneficial from a tax perspective to purchase the building that your practice operates in or build a building on your own that fits your specific requirements. And um, if, if you buy the building and then lease out the uh, space that your practice doesn't occupy, it's a very helpful thing um, to be able to control your, your um you know, physical environment as, as a business owner in the practice. But then what, what happens when you start to think about transitioning into retirement is you can often sell your practice, but maintain ownership of the building in which it resides, which is really a convenient planning tool uh, because it, it provides all the, the, the things that I'm, I'm sure your listeners like about real estate investing. It provides income long-term you know the, the tenants of that building probably better than anyone because um, you know, you've, you've worked with the other tenants for a long time and you're the one who built the business that um, the new owner is now operating. So the likelihood of them not being able to pay rent is something that you know better than anybody else in the world. It produces long-term income and then you can sell it down the road. Um, and, and it's just a really, really powerful long-term wealth builder. So can you talk a little bit more uh, in that instance for medical professionals if they're acquiring the asset that they're practicing in, there's a lot of tax benefits that go along with that. So obviously depreciation is one versus leasing, although you can write off certain items on leases versus what you own. Can you, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? I know you're not a tax you know, CPA, but if you have any insight as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm not an accountant, but taxes are a way of life, you know, and, and with the intention of the firm being to, to help our, our clients do the best they can with their resources, uh, we, we better know a lot about the tax law. And, and this is something that it comes up pretty frequently. So the, structurally, you probably don't want your medical or veterinary or dental business to own the building. You want to do that uh, under a separate entity in an arm's length transaction. And so <clears throat> the, the rules there are that you, you can't charge yourself rent of like $10 a month. You, you, you have to charge yourself an appropriate amount of rent. And you probably want a real estate professional to chime in on what a market rate rent is for the business's space that it's occupying in the building. But this other entity that you create, you, you call it, um, you know, whatever you want, you're right. You get depreciation, which is probably the biggest expense. You have income from uh, the tenants of the building, um, but then all the maintenance you get to control too. And depending on what the landscaping is, uh, how nice the office space is and how nice the building is and so on and so forth, um, you can structure it however you want, you know, tri triple net, um, you can have um, it, there are just a lot of planning options and the way that you structure it really depends on your business situation and your personal situation and what you're trying to accomplish. But it's just another lever that, that gives you a different angle and ability to control the, um, the ultimate outcome. Excellent. Excellent. And when you're advising those clients too, are there any other ways they can leverage, um, some other financial products to invest in? you know, assets like real estate, I think, you know, using life, you had experience with the life insurance and borrowing on that, any, any experience with that? Yeah, yeah, to be honest, um, I'm, I'm usually not a huge advocate of doing that because I, I, at least for, for most of our clients, permanent life insurance that would build a cash value in the first place is not really a good fit. It's, it's not a terribly efficient way to, um, save for the future, utilize your assets. If you have a life insurance policy with a bunch of cash value in there or um, another type of insurance product, perhaps, you, you can access that cash, borrow from it, and then use that cash to purchase real estate. That may be the best route. You know, um, There are all sorts of ways to do that. You can also do it within uh, a qualified plan within a 401k or an IRA in some circumstances. But you have to be very, very careful there. Um, 
and actually, I, I would probably suggest most people don't go that route of if you have uh, a medical practice or any kind of professional practice and you're thinking about buying the building, you probably don't want to buy it with 401k or IRA assets. And the deal there is if, if you invest in real estate within a qualified plan or any kind of retirement plan, you can't have any benefits of ownership because that's a prohibited transaction and it's probably the worst thing that can happen to the assets and there's they all become taxable in the year of the prohibited transaction. So, I mean, investing in real estate within your 401k and IRA, absolutely doable. There are all sorts of self-directed uh, options for that. I'm sure you've covered that on, on the podcast, Anthony, but you probably don't want to use those assets to buy the building that your business is going to sit in. Sure. And we're talking about, just to be clear, owner-occupied situations and we're using the um, yeah. you know, medicine as an example. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. That's right. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so in terms of, you know, some of the uh, risk, a little bit more of the risk management slash estate planning for those, you know, professionals that maybe um, are looking to maybe wind down their practice at a later date, um, you know, like how and maybe they're looking to sell the business and also the real estate. Are there any you know, um, any, any advice that you would give those types of clients? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think all professional services these days are getting a lot of interest from the private equity community. So you have these private equity firms out there with a ton of cash and they're, the strategy for a lot of those types of entities is to roll up a bunch of individual professional practices into one big group and then uh, exit from that group, either through the public markets or selling to another private equity firm or you know, any combination um, of the two. It's happening in financial services. It's happening in my industry. It's happening in, in medicine. It's happening in veterinary care. And so a lot of times when someone in this situation is starting to think about an exit, one of the most viable options for uh, finding a buyer is a private equity firm. And the benefit there is they're often going to, you know, pay you the most for your business they're often going to be the most likely to close on a transaction. And if you don't go with private equity, you have to sell it to your employees. If there are good fits there, you have to find another practitioner to come in and sell it to, or maybe an up and coming pra practitioner who's younger and wants to buy in over time. And so private equity is, is kind of a way of life in professional services right now. And especially because interest rates are super low, it's easy for them to lever, lever up and borrow a bunch of money to finance these things. And when you do that, if you own the building that the business resides in and you're selling the business to private equity, private equity is, or whomever buys the business from you is going to want right of first refusal to renew that lease. And they'll often want right of first refusal if you decide to sell the building too, because it's such a beneficial thing for them to own. Um, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. And, and I've seen some professionals get scared off um, because they just, they have it in the back of their mind when they buy the building, um, you know, initially that when it comes time to sell, they want to market it to the highest bidder and just open it up for, for bids. And this, this concept of backing yourself into a, a corner and giving the right of first refusal to one entity just doesn't sit, sit well with them and they walk away from the deal um, that's otherwise really advantageous. And that's, that's kind of a mistake um, in, in my mind, e even though it's, uh, yeah, you might not get quite as much for the building as you would in, um, in an open bid otherwise, um, that when, when you combine the building with the value of the practice and what you're, t what you're getting out of it ultimately, it's really the best bet. Um, so just, just be aware that if you decide to build uh, a building that the business is going to sit in or purchase the building that you're already in, then just be open um, to options as they come around because private equity has, they just have a lot of cash. And if that's, that's your objective, that's probably going to be a good option. 
Right. That makes a lot of sense. You definitely don't want to thin your options down when you when you take it to market, um, especially for those larger firms. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Grant, how could people find more about you, more about your practice, and uh, how can they reach out to you? Um, check out the number number three oakscapital.com is our website. I've got a, a blog. It's called Above the Canopy. I write on above the canopy.us. And I've got a podcast myself. It's called Grow Money Business. We talk about this stuff. Um, not a whole lot of real estate on that podcast, but just uh, maybe a little bit from time to time. It's more financial planning for business owners. That's excellent. So above the canopy.com, you said? Dot US. Dot US. Yeah, dot, dot okay. US. Perfect. Um, so I'll have a link to that website in the show description on iTunes, as well as on our social media platforms. And for our audience, if you liked what you heard and or saw today, uh, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. It helps Grant and my message get out to a greater audience. That's just because how iTunes works. So we'd appreciate that. And Grant, I really appreciate you coming on again. Hopefully we'll have you on within the next year. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Anthony. This was, this was, this was great. Thank you.